Ghost stories and superstitions abound in the American South. But not to be overlooked are the cryptids, creatures, and overall monsters that lurk in the histories of the small towns and rural forest. One such story is that of Miss Emily Isabella Burt, the introverted, book-loving daughter of wealthy landowners Joel and Mildred Burt. Well, at least by day. By night, legend has it anyway, young Miss Burt prowled the countryside, slaughtering livestock in the form of of a werewolf. Everyone loves a good strange, weird, or bizarre story. Well, welcome to the American South, where dark legends and haunted history lurk around every corner where superstition, folklore, and a touch of backwoods magic blend with everyday culture, some say, in order to survive. This is Dixie After Dark. Emily Isabella Burt was born July 29, 1842, in Talbot County, Georgia, the third of four children to Joel and Mildred Burt. Sadly, though, her father Joel would pass away at the age of 40, only 10 days before Emily would turn six years old. Emily's mother, Mildred, was a resourceful woman, though, and managed to take care of the large plantation on top of raising four children with some assistance from family members that lived nearby. Unlike her siblings, Emily was an introvert, choosing to spend the majority of her time in the family library within the home. Her mother, having become a successful businesswoman, frequently traveled abroad to Europe, especially France where they had relatives. Mildred was happy to bring back books by the hundreds to fuel young Emily's passion. Emily's main genres of choice were books on the supernatural and paranormal. She loved reading the old European myths and folklore. It's said that a large part of her withdrawn nature could be due to the fact that she had a somewhat bizarre appearance due to an overpronounced jaw which caused her a great deal of dental problems. It was claimed by some that Emily's teeth were broken and sharp, so she rarely smiled. Emily did venture from the family home some, though not during the day. She preferred late evening strolls through the forest in the area. For one, this kept her from encountering other people. And two, it was a great way to kill time since young Emily struggled with bouts of insomnia. In fact, it is said that Emily suffered from violent mood swings and severe headaches as well. The headaches were treated by a local physician with opium. There are no reports of the other Burt children having any issues, physically or socially, especially Emily's older sister, Sarah. Sarah was very outgoing and well-liked within the community. She had even caught the eye of William Gorman, the son of a neighboring plantation owner. The two had planned to marry, so William was often at the Burt family home while he was courting young Sarah. On one particular night, Emily overheard William telling the news of strange sheep mutilations on his father's plantation. The animals had been torn to bits, but not eaten, only drained of blood. Sarah was repulsed by the story, but young Emily's interests were piqued by the tale. She continued to listen to them secretly as William continued with the gory details. Once William had left for the evening, Emily demanded that Sarah tell her more about the mutilated sheep. 
Sarah refused to relive the story and turned away to leave. This enraged Emily, who grabbed Sarah by the arm to stop her, only to dislocate Sarah's arm at the shoulder. As the days wore on, attacks on livestock continued to grow, worrying the community. On his next visit, William informed Sarah and Mildred that a hunting party was being formed to find and kill the beast that had been attacking the surrounding livestock. Mildred requested to join the party. As odd as that seemed for the day, William accepted. Mildred's marksmanship was well known in the community. Plus, the hunting party that they were to join was set to patrol the land between the Burt and Gorman plantations. They joined the others in the hunting party at the Gorman plantation and set out with pistols, rifles, and torches to see what they could find. Hours passed by with not so much as a strange noise from the woods around them. Not even the livestock seemed bothered by anything that night. The members in the group were now growing tired and Mildred excused herself for the night to return home. William did offer to walk her home, but Mildred declined the offer. She knew the way as well as anyone, and she was armed after all. It's been said that Mildred was probably a better shot than many of the others in the group, so she was confident she'd be safe. As she traveled down the path back to the Burt estate, Movement in the brush along the side of the path caught her attention. She stopped and drew her pistol. A few tense seconds passed as the movement stopped, but then a creature lunged from the brush straight at her. Mildred fired a shot and the beast let out a shrill scream before running away in the darkness. In a panic, Mildred rushed home as fast as she could through the dark to make sure her children were safe. She made it home without further incident, but as she approached the home, there was a small figure cowering on the front porch. She drew her pistol again and approached cautiously, but as she got closer, she saw that it was Emily. She rushed to her daughter's side to find out what was wrong, only to find that Emily's hand was mangled and nearly blown off by a gunshot wound. Mildred rushed her daughter to the local doctor, who tended to the wound. Reluctantly, she confided in him all that she had saw that night. Surprisingly enough, the doctor didn't seem shocked at all. He informed Miss Bird about a little-known condition at the time, known as lycanthropy. Lycanthropy is a mental condition that causes a person to take on wolf-like characteristics the condition is usually coupled with clinical depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorders. Although the study of mental conditions were still in their infancy in pre-Civil War America, a few European doctors were having some great successes with treating many mental disorders. Mildred agreed to have Emily sent to Europe for treatment as soon as her wounded hand was well enough for travel. As soon as the doctor deemed it safe, Mildred sent Emily to Europe, telling family and loved ones that Emily was visiting family in France. Now, one thing that hasn't changed from the 1800s until now is how fast rumors and gossip spread through a small community. It also didn't go without notice that the livestock mutilations had stopped altogether. Months passed with no more livestock attacks, and eventually, Mildred received word from the doctor in France that Emily had been cured of her affliction and was fit to return home. Mildred was overjoyed, but she also knew the gossip that had been churning through the community. She felt it was best to keep Emily's homecoming a secret. Emily returned home with no one the wiser and returned to her routine solitude in the family library. Mildred kept a close eye on her daughter. Indeed, many of her more outrageous mood swings appeared to be gone, but Emily still preferred to keep to herself, spending almost all of her time in the library reading. 
Mildred kept watch over Emily day and night. But even then, talk of new livestock mutilations sprung up within days of Emily's secret return home. The stories were more scarce than before, though, and eventually they died out altogether. Emily Isabella Burt lived out the rest of her days in solitude in the family home, never marrying and never having any children of her own. She did become a successful woman in the footsteps of her mother. At the time of her death, Emily Isabella Burt owned a 300-acre estate in Talbot County, partial ownership of a warehouse in Talbot County, a house and land in Meriwether County, and a house and land in Columbus, Georgia. She passed away at the age of 69 on June 18, 1911. Emily Isabella Burt is buried in Owen Cemetery in Woodland, a small area in Talbot County, Georgia. Her headstone reads, Thy form alone is all, thank God, that the grave is given. For we know thy soul, the better part, is safe, yes safe, in heaven. Not everyone is convinced that the stories are true, though. The Southeastern Institute of Paranormal Research has dug into the case, and a moderator on their website identified only as Denise claims that the stories are false, somewhat vehemently so, although those claims can no longer be found on their site. The person identified as Denise does tend to crop up from time to time in forums to provide her evidence. According to Denise, She's completely debunked the Georgia werewolf story as it relates to Emily Isabella Burt. Well, okay then. Cool. Let's hear it. How did you do that? In her own words, quote, I have a copy of the last will and testament as well as her obituary, and not once was she referred to as Miss Werewolf. End quote. Well, there you go, folks. You heard it here first. Fact check, false. Okay, in all seriousness, that's not really proof. But how can you really prove Emily was a werewolf either? It's one of those things where we just have to look at the history and come to our own conclusions. Here's my question. If attacks on livestock was causing that much turmoil in Talbot County, then what caused them to stop? Newspaper articles can be found reporting on the attacks, but nothing on what caused them to stop or any other creature being killed and labeled as the culprit. For that type of community, that would have made big news to put the people at ease. Were the rumors about Emily too much for her to bear, and that's why she continued to stay withdrawn and never marry? Or did she know what she was and couldn't handle the idea of passing down that kind of curse to her own offspring? Sure, that's wild speculation on my part, but to me, it's no different than saying there's no way Emily was a werewolf because her obituary didn't say she was. The Sagan Standard states, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I'm not saying I believe Emily Isabella Burt was in fact a werewolf, but we're looking at accounts that survived nearly 200 years of time and eyewitness accounts and medical record evidence to support at least part of that claim. I'm going to need your debunk game to be a little better than the obituary didn't say she was a werewolf. Case closed. What do you think?